November is fast approaching and with it non-fiction November. Now I don't usually participate in non-fiction November because I read a whole lot of non-fiction anyway, much more than I talk about on this channel. And if I were to up my pensum beyond that, it wouldn't be with books. Book chapters maybe, but not books. So I've been thinking about ways in which I can nevertheless contribute to non-fiction November. And I noticed that there is a lot of overlap between my favorite German nonfiction and translated German nonfiction. So I've made a list. Now, this is not the list of my top five favorite German nonfiction titles of all time, because there is still a whole lot of German nonfiction that I love, but that hasn't been translated and never will be translated. But this is close. To begin with, I picked something that is short and funny, but nevertheless profound. The Situation is Hopeless but Not Serious by Paul Watzlawick, subtitled The Pursuit of Unhappiness, and that is more or less its German title as well, Anleitung zum Unglücklichsein. Paul Watzlawick is from Austria originally and is famous as a psychologist and a communication theorist. And in this small book, he satirizes the self-help literature, but also goes far beyond that and in an accessible way reveals the psychological mechanisms that lie at the bottom of so much of our unhappiness. He describes the patterns by which we trap ourselves in cycles of bad situations patterns of behavior, but also patterns of thought. And he describes the harmful ways in which we perceive reality and really construct our reality in ways that only serve to harm ourselves and trap ourselves in impossible situations. It is instructive in the sense that it puts a name to these usually invisible mechanisms and that is usually the first step or the requirement for change and evolution and the solution of a problem. It is an extremely funny book, however, you have to have the capacity for self-irony. I know that some people don't and for people like that, this book probably won't work. But if you do self-irony, this is extremely funny. The next one is the big one, Dialectics of Enlightenment by Max Horkheimer and Theodor W. Adorno, the Frankfurt School, if you like. This is actually a collection of essays of varying length. The shortest ones are just very short paragraphs and the whole collection is therefore called Fragments. This is one of the most famous works of German philosophy ever and with good reason. In these essays Horkheimer and Adorno reveal how ever since the so-called Enlightenment the single-minded pursuit of rationality and this putting on a pedestal of the idea of rationality hasn't actually led to the liberation of all mankind, but on the contrary, to more and more oppression, really. And even art and culture have been co-opted and are utilized in this oppression, all in the clothes of enlightenment and mental sobriety and a literally a mind over matter approach to anything and everything in life. The only problem with these essays is that they are the opposite of accessible. And that's a shame because they talk about such important things that everybody should have an informed opinion on, I think. But they are rather exhausting, really, to work through. But it is so worth it and that is why I am nevertheless recommending this book here. My next book is a bit of an outlier because it isn't actually one of my favorites, but I will explain. It is The Birth of Tragedy by Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche was a classical philologist, like just about every scholar before 1980 it seems. Um, this was published in 1871 
and it's about art and literature and culture and ritual in ancient Greece. And at the time it was published, it caused quite an uproar among classicists because it did away with or aimed to do away with the idealized image of ancient Greece and of the inherent nobility of the ancient Greek that was so predominant among classicists. However, it is rather romanticizing in its own way and is almost more fiction than fact. And in fact, the older Nietzsche disavowed his earlier work. But unfortunately, by then, this had already taken on in a life of its own because it became one of the foundational works of classical modernity and, and art and literature in classical modernity. Because with this book, Nietzsche popularized the idea of the two dueling principles that underlie everything, including the human nature the Apollonian principle and the Dionysian principle. The Apollonian representing order, clarity, logic, and the Dionysian principle, the wild, the ecstatic, the disorderly. And the idea of this duality is nearly ubiquitous in modern European art and literature. And that is why I'm recommending this book, because it is so important from a historical point of view. And from ancient Greece to ancient Egypt, Cultural Memory and Early Civilization by Jan Asman. Jan Asman is one of our leading Egyptologists. He is retired now, but still writing. And a few years ago, he and his wife, Alida Asman, won the Peace Prize of the German Book Trade, um, one of our most important literary prizes for their sociological and political writings. And in this book, Asman describes the effect that cultural memory had on the life of the individual in ancient Egypt and then in turn again on broader society. So the interplay and the reciprocal effects between the individual and society. But what makes this book valuable beyond any interest in Egyptology is that it can also serve as an introduction into these basic concepts of sociology. And you get Egyptology on top of it to make it more fun. And just like Asman's book, my last book is one of the very few works of classical scholarship that have been translated. Because in classics, history and the humanities in general, we are still trying to preserve a plurality of languages. But every once in a while, a book gets translated if it appeals to a wide readership. And my last book is just such a book. It is one of those very few special cases that appeal to a scholarly audience as well as to lay people. It is The Power of Images in the Age of Augustus. The author Paul Sanka is an archaeologist, and this book shows how Augustus used images in the public space in Rome and its dependencies for his political agenda. Images of all kinds, art, architecture, coinage, and including literature. And in doing so, Tsanka gives you a very accessible, very memorable introduction and overview of Augustus's career and of the zeitgeist in Rome during Augustus's time in general. This was published in 1987 and is still one of the most famous, most widely read works of classical scholarship, read by archaeologists as well as historians and I guess a good number of philologists as well. And I would say it is also still one of the most well-liked works. So these are the five books that I wanted to briefly show you today. I hope you have a good nonfiction November and that maybe you pick up one or two of these books. If not in November, then maybe in December or next year or the year after. Bye, guys. <laughs>